Hi everyone and welcome to today's interview. Mikael will be speaking to Yazid, who is a dedicated staff member at Choice Rehabilitation. Today, they will delve into the intricacies of the drug rehabilitation program, exploring the various approaches and resources available to those seeking recovery. They will discuss what participants can expect, the support systems in place, and the overall impact of the program. Thank you for joining and let's get started. Uh, purple or red? And the red. Red. Okay. I would have chosen that myself. Okay. It's been chosen for you by the universe. So, yeah, the session that I was sitting yes. in, what what was I sitting in? What was it actually? Um, we have uh, recognizing the need for, for step work in the house. Um, we, have, we have been incorporating the 12 steps into our program for some time. Okay. And we were just going through, passing from step eight to step nine. And that was what we were currently conducting in yeah. the introduction to step nine. Okay. Oh, I enjoyed it. That's why I asked okay. I mean, why the, yeah. the clients or the patients, uh, they were so into it, basically. And, uh, yeah, because I, of the current need, the climate of um, the requirements of amends to be made. And step eight and step nine is all about amends, which is yeah. a dire need of all of us that is trying to overcome this addiction that can't be done without the reparations of the relationships that we have yeah. damaged, yeah. the emotions that we have created, the trauma that we have created, it all needs to be repaired in order for us to have a more comfortable and satisfying recovery. Yeah, yeah, okay. So that's why it was because, I mean, everybody has something to write, relate to when it comes generally to, yeah. it is a, a common uh, commonality and uh, uh, a similar need of all of us that is in recovery that um, that step needs to be covered yeah. but even though it's a requirement and uh, it's a much needed step it's a very difficult step yeah and therefore it's always important to understand the steps are there for a reason the order of the steps is important to understand you can't jump from step one to step eight. There need to be a foundation laid yeah. before you actually can engage with step eight or step nine. Step one to four is important to actually lay some groundwork and some yeah. foundation for some type of development and progress to be present yeah. before you embark on the rest of the difficult steps. And there are difficult steps. Okay. But as well received and there's enthusiasm because the guys at the moment are very keen on repairing the relationships that are broken in their lives. Of course. Which is a good sign. Yeah. Some people have reluctance, but fortunately our boys in our house, they're very eager to fix what they have broken. Yeah. I believe that's the atmosphere that I think yeah. the, the, the house provides. That's what I see. We have to create that atmosphere. I mean, yeah. it doesn't come uh, like, uh, maybe it's God given, maybe the same God's handing it. Yeah. But this is a, sometimes it's an arduous and tiresome process because there will always, always be some resistance to the, 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 the need to create a, yeah. a harmonious atmosphere. You'll, but, you'll have people that will still come with a lot of street culture and subculture. Of course, of course. To complicate that process because not everybody wants there to be a sense of harmony in the house. Some people are <laughs> inclined to be. You know, if I could say, unbreakers. Yeah. Well, you know, it sounds like everyday life. They have, they have chaos within them. Yeah. And they just bring chaos wherever they go, like a tornado. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good uh, depiction of what life is out there. I mean, what exactly, is... Exactly. Uh, yeah. It's exactly. It's ups and downs is how you deal with it. And I guess... Exactly. That's why we're yeah. here. That's why they are yeah. there too. Yeah. So... The, uh, you were speaking about the program in detail, about all these steps and things like that. Um, it's very evident to me that the programs, they're getting it, right? I'm just looking at the other side of things as well, what we don't see. So yeah. the daily routine, the structure yeah. that the boys go through, and maybe you can run us through that a little bit. Sometimes the, the, the mass and the, the group, the, the, the clients, they are unaware of what the program is actually and how it's unfolded over time. The yeah. program has evolved over time because if I look at when, when I started designing programs, it was back in 1998, we're talking almost 30 years ago. It was about 26, 27 years ago this wow. year, approaching 30 years. And over that time, I fortunate had the, the, the good fortune 
to travel a bit and do programs overseas. Was this just when you got into it? When I got into it, my nice. first program I did okay. in 1998, I went to a place called Pertapas in Singapore. They had a very good program from um, research done at the time by a local community organization. They sent us to Singapore to do this program. It was a very difficult program, but it had excellent results. Yeah. At the time, Singapore had a serious heroin problem, which we never had yet, but we foresaw it coming. Okay. At the time, we just had man rest, crash, ecstasy as drugs of abuse, but there were sprinkles of heroin use around Cape Town. We knew it was coming. We knew it was going to be an epidemic. And at the time, Singapore really had a drug problem, a head, a specifically heroin problem. Yeah. But they had an excellent treatment model. Okay. At the time, it was a therapeutic community-based model, which um, I later um, introduced to Cape Town. Uh, contain things that most rehabs in Cape Town use today, things like the morning meeting and the creed and the structures and the pillars of normal programming. So myself, I didn't do it alone. I had two colleagues with me when we came back. You know, we opened two different rehabs. We opened uh, Horizons and the audience. And from that time, me and my, my colleagues and I, we went to different places internationally. We went to this party in Indonesia. I myself went to date up in New York. Yeah. Uh, I went to Amity Foundation, Los Angeles and San Diego. Nice. I went to, um, uh, I, I attended the United Nations conference in Austria, in Vienna. And there I networked with some people that exposed me to different programs. Yeah. The Minnesota model, the Matrix model, the 12th. The 12th. We, what I did was over the duration of the 25 years, mm. I, I've, I've meshed a variety of programs together to yeah. get to one approach, right? And it's an approach that would work and be efficient because over time we see the, the culture of drug addiction changing. Yes. So if the culture of drug addiction changed, the approach of recovery and programming needs to change along with it. Yeah, of course. So it, what, what worked in the 90s, wasn't working in the 2000s. What worked in the 2000s wasn't working in the last decade. So we had to make some relevant changes. So as we made the changes, we got better results. Of course, yeah. So obviously, um, with all the learning I did, um, I tried to share the information as best as I could. Nice. I've developed various programs over time for various organizations, but mostly it's, it's been community-based. Yeah. I've always done community work. None of it was done for, for clinics, for private organizations. It was mostly community-driven. And um, I had the good fortune because in, in 2009, I was requested by the World Health Organization as well as the United Nations to compile um, a synopsis on the, the, the current um, drug situation in, on the Cape Flats. Yeah. I presented that to the United Nations. It's one of the, the, the outstanding um, experience of my life because I sat with the diplomats at the United Nations and oh. I couldn't believe at the time that me, a Cape Town addict, was sitting amongst, you know, people that were key role players in the, in the field of recovery. And I was a recovering addict and, and I, I always encourage people to understand that no matter what addiction has done to you, to your life, it was a temporary experience if you allow it to be temporary. With that yeah. information of addiction, you can do so much. Yeah. It's what you're doing, what I'm doing. Yeah. We're imparting the information that we've gathered from our addiction to help others, not just prevent them from getting worse, but also to stabilize their lives yeah. so that they can live more productive lives. And in turn, they should help others. If they do well, they help others do well. So it's a constant ripple effect of assistance for as much people as possible. Because if I look today, the amount of rehabs using the creed alone. And I remember when I came across the creed for the very first time, it wasn't available here in Cape Town. It made so much sense to me that I knew everybody that I knew that was caught in the grips of addiction would understand yeah. and make use of this creed. When you and say creed, what, 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 what are we talking creed about? Creed was a, po a poem wrote, uh, written by Richard Buvis in the 60s. 
Yeah. He was a recovery alcoholic who was in prison in Staten Island in New York. I had the good fortune of visiting his, his prison oh. where he was in, 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 uh, at the top. He, he, from there, he wrote his poem and he recovered well until even he had a relapse and he passed away. But he left behind a legacy of recovery because in that poem, the experience of Alex is captured. The essence of recovery is captured in that poem okay. that any addict that would read that poem would understand yeah. that the first paragraph is to do with your addiction and the second paragraph is to do with your recovery. Yeah. And in essence, it captures everything that's required for an addict to develop himself yeah. in two simple paragraphs. So between then and now, 1998 till now, thousands, tens of thousands of addicts have come across the street and most and you come across it, they would know it yeah. by heart because recitation of it, you know, yeah. has been, you know, uh, as they done so often that we, we talk, we, we say every day, and I remember the one therapist in, in New York told me that that would be like a passport that you carry in your heart for your recovery. Wherever you go, take it mm. with you, your travels will be well. The you travel idea. well through your life with the creed as your passport, yeah. no matter where you go. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've traveled a bit, but I'm talking about even locally, wherever you go, wherever you like, takes you metaphorically. Yeah. That creed could be a passport for you as a guiding light should you experience any possible difficulty. Yeah. You can still fall back on that creed as a guideline. So the creed falls part of our program, as it does with many programs in Cape Town, but also, we have different services that we offer to make our program I was going very to say efficient. That. We have much other services. Yeah. Uh, when, when the videos come in, the very first thing we do is we grant them the access to a medical doctor because we can't embark on a process of recovery and, um, and dispense psychological assistance, emotional assistance without knowing the physical condition of the person no, and what damage first. the drugs have done. Yeah. So the doctor's appointment is the very, very first thing before anything else. Then they'll embark on a period of the detoxification where we try and rid the body of all tox intoxicants in the body, whether it be alcohol, whether it be drugs, whether it be tablets, prescription tablets, we try and rid that body of any possible intoxicants. The reason for this is we want the brain to function to its optimum, yeah. so that the learning can take place I can see as in the best classes. as possible. Yeah. What you see now is end results towards the middle or end of the yeah. process, because our guys are all cleaning the house because of regular testing. Yeah. So, okay. our, but the group that we have now is a very mature group, and a lot of them has past experience with uh, addiction and recovery. So they have a lot of information to share. Yeah. As you, much as they learn from me, I learn from them. You say the group that you have now. Yes. So um, that begs the question. So every time you pick up, there's a new type there's of group. Cycle, and that yeah. changes. So, I mean, that's where your experience comes into what you give. There's a big turnover. For, uh, yeah. a turnover all the, I mean, the I like group that. changes all the time. But um, the culture will remain the same. If you have a good group, right? The maturity and the, uh, the level of um, enthusiasm of that group can ripple into the next group and to the next group, True. depending on how solid that culture is. It can vacuum in. Any person that comes in will be vacuumed into that culture. Yeah. That's how we have it now. Whatever new guy comes in now, he yeah. just vacuum into a culture to really set. And our culture, even though we have services like we have access to medical care, we have access to a very good social worker if needs be. We have our nice. guys that go to a very good psychiatrist. He's a very well-known psychiatrist well known, yeah. in Cape Town. Um, our, our referrals is to that psychiatrist because he does his job very well. He has extensive experience with addiction. Um, our guys go to the clinic. We have access to our psychiatric nurse yeah. who is also very well experienced in the field. We have access to um, our lawyer and our, 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 our okay. law team, we have an advocate oh. on standby should... Addiction comes with that. Should we have yeah. any legal issues, which we have plenty of yeah. uh, legal <laughs> problems, right? And the court cases and the criminal activity, which result in jail time, which result in diversions, which result in you know, court appearances. Diversions? So we have... Um, well, well, the diversions is where we try and encourage the court system and the justice system 
to refer um, the, the suffering addict into rehab care instead of imprisonment. Okay. So it's a diversion where we'll try and we'll usually forward a letter to the court on behalf of the individual and his family so that the court will find, you know, some grace yeah. instead of being punitive and punish this individual who's suffering from addiction. Yeah. To rather have him undergo a process of development. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, we know the state and, of the prisons how, over yeah, here. That's not going to The state of the prisons now, even it's though looking. it's promoted as rehabilitation mm -mm. or um, they have workshops and, you know, um, some teachings in the prison, our prisons are really bad because of the gang system and the number system, that's the culture of our prisons in Cape Town. Yeah. So, a lot of the learning is with that culture. So, no, even no, coming out of there, I feel they need the recovery from that even. Exactly. So and, and, and makes and, uh, the situation guys, worse. How do you guys deal with that though? So No, uh, we, we no. have even within our program incorporated is um, lifestyle change and behavior management, yeah. which is factors of the program which would tackle those type of cultures, Clients. right? So, yeah. uh, for example, you have guys coming out of prison with, um, with experience of prison gangs. At the moment, we have we have members of our group that covers all the gangs. We have 26, 27, 28. But our program would, would approach the matter with trying to reinstall past learnings like family values, yeah. right living, yeah. the betterment of self, going after your goals you had before you went to prison. Yeah. So we try and incorporate different approaches to replace that culture that they become so used to while they were in jail. Yeah. So, like I say, no matter what the problem is, no matter what difficult the person is experiencing, we try and assist the person the best way we can. I, I can and see that. With my experience, I, I don't do it alone. It's a team effort. Yeah. We have a good team. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I was sitting in the session and looking at the boys. I mean, you said they met them towards the end. And that, again, it's evidence that it's actually working because I'm pretty sure, mm. I don't know what percentage of the, they've been through those type of things, yeah. but I don't see it. Yeah. So, so, As yeah. well, I just put Eddie because our boys are doing it really well because even our director, I've, been, I've worked with many directors. Um, our, our director is one of the best administrators of the rehab I've ever worked with. Okay. He administrates the rehab well. Mm. I mean, it's very difficult to sustain a rehab over time which he has done successfully yeah it's almost 20 years now i've been working with this man yeah and i mean it. with all the trials and tribulations that usually occurs within rehabs the successes Stupid and failures time. our doors have been open i mean yeah for almost 20 years now and we'll be celebrating our 17th anniversary um, nice. next month Wow. Which is in this field, it's, it's quite a good number <laughs> because a lot of rehab start, fail, start and fail because of, you know, deficiencies in the approach to treatment. Yeah. So we try and offer uh, a care, compassion and a, a level of forgiveness because a lot of our, our, our clients are returning clients, right? Okay. Where we don't pass judgment on them. Being a recovery addict myself, I understand the concept of relapse. I understand the concept of start, try, fail, try again. The the concept of building up and just losing everything because of mm. silly decisions. I personally, personal experience with it. Yeah. So if somebody comes in and they fail five times, I believe they have the ability to do the six times. Of course. If they fail ten times, the fact that and they, they believe that they can do it the eleventh time. Yeah. Who am I to judge? Never. Because yeah, I've can't. seen people do it at various times. Everybody doesn't recover at the same time in the same way. Yeah. People recover at different times. I've seen it done. But then again, I've seen pe people do it the first time out of the gates. They yeah. do really well. Then I've seen people that succeed on the third attempt and then they do really well. So nobody can judge and predict the outcome of any recovery. But one thing I can tell you, the more you invest in your process, the better results you have. And that is now talking from the individual themselves. Yeah. You can offer the best services, the best treatment possible on this planet. But if the person isn't willing to make the change, mm. there will be no change. Yeah. And then again, on the flip side, 
a person, if he really wants to recover, he can recover in the heart of the ghetto. If he really wants to and is willing to recover, I've seen people recover even though the odds are entirely stacked against them. Yeah. They still recover because of determination. Yeah. Sometimes addiction takes you to a very dark place where you don't want to revisit again. Mm. And you're willing to do whatever mm. it takes yeah. to get clean again. Nice. Because nice. Your, your last relapse was so bad and you feel, shit, I don't want, I'm, I'm through with this life, man. I yeah. had enough of it. And then you're just determined yeah. and you, make your, you know you make your intention strong and you just flourish after that. Yeah. I've seen that happen. And that's the beauty of this, this thing of recovery, man, you know. Uh, you have your personal experience, but to see other people do it, it just motivates you even more because it creates a possibility and hope. Yeah. Where before, hope was lost. Yeah. Because we feel that a lot of That's the, yeah. and the That's the thing, that a lot of the light here in Cape Town, although it is, I, I believe, the reality, it's addiction, wherever you look, gangsterism, crime, etc. However, I feel like, like with the purpose of this video as well, it's to shed some light that there are places exactly. out there, educate, there are experiences. Educate people. There's probably so many thousands out there that also have this experience as well. And I mean, what you guys are doing here, what you are doing specifically as well with your vast experiences, um, you're still on the ground doing the work, changing lives. Um, it's big. It's big. So um, Somebody has to do it. Not yeah. everybody's willing. Yeah. Yeah. Even what you do is important because you're bringing um, the information to the masses. Yeah. Information that before vital, you yeah. did it wasn't accessible. Now you're making it feel accessible to people so that they can also understand that there isn't anybody that doesn't have access to this thing True. called recovery. It's yeah. available to everybody because it's a concept that People sometimes misunderstand and think, I need to have a fortune in order for my child to recover well. It's not the case. Mm. There are services available that are very, very cost effective. Yeah. And that there are even services that are free where individuals can undergo steps where not even a cent has to be expended. Yeah. All right. I just need to know that people need, uh, what I would like is that people to know that recovery is available for everybody, including their families. Nice, nice. Well, what are the, uh, let's, say, let's call it follow-up support do you guys provide for the, for the boys? Oh, and Lovely question. Um, I, I would ask for, in the same question, for no. the family members and for the people out there, do you guys offer any services for them too? Okay. No. We have yeah. a very, um, I think, um, long-standing, uh, support group that has been running as long as Choice has been in existence. We've had our Tuesday night support group. Okay. It's a free service that has been um, hosted on a Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock. Did you say open to the public? Yeah, as long as I oh. can remember. It's not just open to the, the, the clients and the families of the clients. It's open to anybody that's interested. Yeah. So if we nice. like uh, want, want, want people to know, we'll, we'll expose it as a community meeting whereby people can attend um, without any judgment and offense being passed. It is a platform where education is dispensed, assistance is dispensed to whomsoever might need it. But mostly it's about supporting the suffering addict and the suffering family. Yeah. That is the reason why the meeting was started in the first place as a form of aftercare. But sometimes, okay. it's not aftercare, okay. it's an introductory uh, meeting where people will hear about, oh, there's a meeting, let me go to the meeting and check it out. And from there, interest will be shown for the recovery of the individual. Yeah. So even though it's part of our aftercare structure, once you completed your primary and secondary care, sobriety residence, you're working, you exit the program, you have been discharged, it's expected that you come weekly for your weekly session to yes. the support group. Yeah. Even though it was initially a full part of our aftercare structure, it is also an introductory meeting for somebody that just wants just access to treatment nice. or access to recovery. So it's actually it it's covers for everything. various reasons for whoever <laughs> yeah. needs what. So if you yeah. ask me, what happens at the meeting? I say, you don't have to talk. You can just come and listen. Yeah. Because sometimes you just sit and you listen to the stories. 
there's power and there's strength in the story, yeah, especially on the parents that have survived, not just the addict that they've survived. Yeah. The parents that survived because sometimes people overlook, they think it's the addict that suffers the most. The addicts, addicts mm. suffer, yes. But the mother, the father, the wife, mm. the children, mm. there's such a huge amount of suffering. So when they, the parents and the family member recover well, they lay groundwork for other parents to recover well. Awesome. Because if I have a kid using, I don't have all the answers to repair that relationship, but the, another parent of addict might have the answers I need and it will be found in our after care program, which is a Tuesday night support group. Indeed. Okay, nice. I like that the one part of the program literally covers us so many people. Yes. Killing how many birds with one stone over there. And then uh, I was at the, I think it was last weekend. Yeah. At the, at the, whether it's coming to see the director and there were boys there. And like I said, it was over the weekend and they looked totally different. I think mm. something you mentioned now about yeah. the residential, I don't know. Yeah. Like they look like men that's working, but they were at the rehab in the group. And so yeah, is are. that another? Yes, another component of a program. Because after I did training in residential care, obviously there was a, a, a vacant area that I needed to go learn and I did a, I did a secondary care program yeah. as well as the after care program in Indonesia and Malaysia. And fortunately for me, I, I got a scholarship to go to California. I did a prison based program as well. Okay. It was a, a therapeutic program based within the prison okay. to prepare that convicts that incarcerated so that they can be blended back into society but with already some development and some changes in place already and they would go to a half hours first and then be released back into society so there's a process of development and change before they actually go amongst the community again so i've taken that also and try and incorporate that into our secondary care program where we don't like to release our guys and have them exit unemployed. Okay. So it's very um, encouraged that try and get work while you are in treatment and you'll move from our primary care phase into our secondary care phase where you can work from the facility for a while. Nice. So nice. a lot of our guys, a big percentage of our guys, they work out but they live in. Mm. As to create a routine that is regimented and targeted to, to manage their time, manage their money, manage their finances, the manage recovery. their relationships, yeah. so that when they eventually go home, they already have a routine in place yeah. to make the adjustment process a bit easier for them. Okay, so nice. they already acclimated to a lifestyle that they ideally want. So. Before we used to, I mean, back in the day, we used to just do primary program, do your two, three months, go home, but they go home unemployed. So there's a big chunk of the day mm. that's vacant, that creates boredom, which obviously creates cravings that would, could lead to um, the addiction all over yeah. again. Yeah. So because of the teachings which we've honest over time, we've made the necessary changes to our program so it can be much more complete and holistic. Holistic, yeah. yeah. Like holistic being key so we get a better wholesome recovery, more complete recovery compared to days gone by. Yeah, not a uh, one size fits all. Uh, no, there's no that's one, what I love yeah. about this place. It it's, can't be one size fits all because even though we have a program that we, we do a lot of group work, I do a lot of individual um, therapy as well, yeah. specifically targeting the individual needs of the person because there might be similarities but also there are differences that need to be done privately, of course, yeah. separate, yeah. separate from the group, yeah. right? So they, they, uh, uh, they would like to think one size fits all but in today's uh, climate with addiction we can't. Yeah. We have to be I versatile, we have to be flexible. The rigid programs of past where you force change and you, you have a blanket type of recovery <laughs> for everybody yeah. is not efficient anymore. Yeah. The yeah. changes had to be made over time, but like I say, we had to go learn what it was because yeah. overseas, you know, um, 
they have much more developed programs and approaches because they've had the drug problems longer than us. Yeah. They've had the heroin way back in the 50s. We only had it in the 90s. Um, the meth problem we're having now, they've had decades ago. So because of, of that reason, they've got much more developed programs and yeah. approaches. Yeah. So I had to go learn what those programs and approaches was to bring it back and incorporate it into yeah. our program so we can stay modern, we can stay relevant, yeah. we can stay up to date with what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. For the so current climate. For, for like the current say, climate. Yeah. So yeah. we will include what works and we'll extract what doesn't work yeah. depending on the current climate of the addiction yeah. in Cape Town. I mean, I just had an interview with one of the boys yeah. with the pharmaceuticals and that blew my mind. Yes, but that's geez. becoming the current, that Look at that. The current like climate. Say, that it's, is the current climate yeah. at the moment. Yeah. That pharmaceuticals, I feel like in America, it is the, the worst epidemic I think America has seen for decades, the opiate e epidemic, but it's not heroin, it's the Oxy and the Xanax. Yeah. And it's a serious epidemic. If you keep up to date with the news, it's whatever happens in America, a few years later, it happens in South Africa or mm. the rest of the world. Yeah. It will start somewhere in the West and uh, end the up in Africa. They're testing it out there. <laughs> a trial, trial run, <laughs> and then eventually ends up here. Mm. But I'm not shocked anymore because there's enough documentaries have done, series being done on the, the current uh, opioid e epidemic. Yeah. And I'm not surprised that it just hits our shores now. Yeah. And we have a serious problem that I foresee happening and it's not going to happen in five years, 10 years. It's going to take one or two years and we're going to have a serious prescription drug problem in Cape Town. Yeah. It's already in its infancy, to say, yeah. but it's going to develop very, very rapidly. So yes. Like the drug use usually does, it hits our markets, but the moment it hits the, the underground and it hits the Cape Flats, it becomes a problem. Yeah. Because they target the kids, they target the unemployed, they target the, the, the less fortunate, and they are usually the ones that suffer the most. Terrible, man. Yeah. Right. I just want to go back to, the, to, to what you mentioned about the, the one-size-fits-all approach yeah. and looking at the current situation. I don't think you're going to want to comment on this, but I'm just going to be as raw as possible here. That is one of the biggest problems in Cape Town is the state of rehabilitations currently for the amount of rehabilitation needed yes. out there, right? And that are still using one-size-fits-all approaches, etc. Yes. What would then be your advice or what would you tell people out there that are looking for help, what do they look for in the, the rehabilitations? What can they, can they actually go and pop in and ask questions? Look at what is, how would you go about getting the a first, service the like first this? Question I, I just want to say, because I know our stories where you go and you hear a story and you just go and you don't know actually what's happening there where there's yeah. a lot worse things happening and yeah. makes the person come up. Yeah. I'm not, not I'm not into the um, rehab bashing and no, no, the fighting yeah. all the other rehab. It's the, reality. Been, the reality of the matter is I've had friends that have been injured in other rehabs. Yeah. I've had friends that have been emotionally traumatized in other rehabs. Yeah. I've heard of stories of kids losing their lives in other rehabs because of being beaten. Jeez. Because I've believed in one thing in all my years that shame and physical violence does not bring about change. Therapy, psychotherapy, um, therapeutic approaches, mm. which is directed at healing the mind, healing the, the, the internal struggle of the addict, yeah. the, the hopelessness, the, the fears that they have, the insecurities they have, the shame and guilt that they carry mm. cannot be resolved <laughs> through violence. Yeah. It would have the adverse effect. Yeah. The violence would bring about more resentment, more anger yeah. to pile on the already present anger yeah. and resentment. Yeah. So we need to have an approach of, of a therapeutic nature where health and healing becomes priority. Yes. And it can't yeah. be uh, compromised, right, through a silly or inefficient approach. Yeah. So 
Uh, we don't believe in that approach. So the first thing I would say as advice is check the program out. Mm. Our program is on the wall in, 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 in our lounge the moment you come in because we have a very homely feel to our facility. Indeed, yeah. Um, uh, if, you, if you can go through our facility, you go into our door, you walk into a lounge, like you walk into a home. Mm. Um, we have a family situation where we all eat together, we move around together, we have our sessions together, we have structures in the house where everybody has a role to play, yeah. everybody has something to do, including myself, everybody in the facility would have some contribution to the success of the home. Yes. So why it's essential is because that way, that is where the individual is going back to once he leaves. Yeah. He's going back home. Yeah. So how do we prepare him to go back home is to create a home environment. Yeah. So take note of those changes yeah. that's so good. If, if you have an environment where the kid is being beaten and there's street oh. culture and there's subculture and there's aggression and violence, mm. he's going to expect to be going back to that once he leaves. Mm. Because that's what his routine that's is going to be. With, yeah. So we need to create a wholesome routine that's regimented based on family values, yeah. responsibility, compassion, nice. care and concern for one another, yes. generosity. If I have something somebody else has, let's have an air of sharing. Let's have an atmosphere of care mm. instead of having this bitter, angry, mm. uh, addict all the time. That, get, that, 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 that faces challenges that he faced on the street, but now he's facing it in the rehab. That can't work. Yeah. That I came from an, an environment of violence and now I come back. No, we don't believe in that approach that a lot of rehabs have used. But like I say, we have well trained um, staff that's educated, and that's also something to look at when you go into a rehab is um, do you have qualified staff? Of is course. the staff qualified to do what they are doing? Is the, is the place conducive for treatment to take place? Do they have uh, good meals that they're eating? Is the good nourishment? Is the system efficient enough to reach the objective, which is mm. a quality recovery? Yeah. But right. I said, you know what? It feels like we can speak for ages. Oh, me, I can speak. I, I'd like to invite you again for another episode. Oh, anytime. For you, oh. anytime. <laughs> Excellent stuff. So, um, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that unfortunately brings us to an episode one, I'd say one of one with uh, the main man here, Yazid. I, I, uh, the director told me you are the Michael Jordan of uh, re rehabilitation and treatment. And I My see you now. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Sounds hard to the impression. So mm -hmm. um, I can see why, honestly. Jokes okay. aside and um, keep up the great work that you are doing. Anytime. Um, I hope the people out there have learned a thing or two. I have definitely learned yeah. a lot now from that. And again, keep the great work up. Thank Everybody you, Mikhail, for the opportunity and yeah. for the good questions. Good job. Ah, thank you, sir. So everybody else, tune in again. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Um, we'll see you soon for another episode. Peace.